Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Welcome to Salt Lake City. We are just absolutely thrilled to have this incredible Filevine community, this incredible audience, these great customers here with us today. It energizes us. I hope it energizes you. We had a great time watching the Super Bowl together. I got to tell you, we have got an action packed event. There is so much coming out, so much for you to learn about. We've got a lot to tell you and a lot to learn. So we are going to take some time. We talk a lot about mountains at Filevine. I apologize. That is just who we are. I love hiking. I love being in the mountains. I love being elevated. And here today, we get to lift our vista and reimagine the legal experience from a higher altitude. And as the CEO of Filevine, one thing I think about a lot is sort of where we're going and who we are and what we're going to be doing. There are four questions the CEO I ask myself every single day. Now, I might ask them implicitly, but I'm asking them all the time. Number one, what is the state of the world? Where are we going? What is going on in the world that might impact legal? And to the extent the world impacts legal, and it does all the time, and by the way, it goes vice versa, right? There's also legal that impacts the world. How is that interaction impacting our community, our customers, our partners, the people that know and love Filevine, the lawyers who aren't customers now but will be soon? How does that impact all of us? And given all that information, given sort of the chessboard that we find ourselves playing on at any given moment, how should Filevine respond? That's what I do as CEO. I think about those four questions all the time. Today, we're going to talk through all four of those and where I think the vision of this company is going. I think you all are owed that. The people in this room have bought Filevine and are committed to it for a decade or more. I hope in 20 years, you will still all be using Filevine. And to make that happen, you have to have a company that cares deeply about where we are going. And if there's anything you know about me, if you've met me personally, you know I care about this stuff a lot. And today I'm going to give you a thesis for my speech, exactly where I think things are going. I don't want to scare you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. AI will replace lawyers who fail to adapt with it. We have an opportunity as an industry to do something completely unique. At this time, we are beginning to see the first stages of leverage, the likes of which we have never seen as legal professionals. And I can tell you, you will have to use it to further your career, to further your firm, to further your practice. So, how did I arrive at this conclusion? Well, let's think about the state of the world. The state of the world is in flux. It is in a very different situation than just a few years ago. The labor force is changing. I don't have to tell any of you this. For those of you in this room who are hiring people, you already know it. You already know how hard it can be to find great people, to attract and retain them. It is really tough out there. And here's the bad news. It's not getting any better. In fact, if Chairman Powell was to be believed, and I think he should be, he knows a thing or two about this stuff, he says low unemployment in the face of rising interest rates appears to be structural, not cyclical. Think about that for a minute. What he's actually telling us is that the low labor environment is something we are going to be stuck with for a very long time, perhaps permanently. And when we do find workers, what do they want out of us? 87% of workers want to work remotely at least some of the time. And the more you want them back in the office, the harder they're going to make life on you. So I know this personally, by the way. What I can tell you is that I count myself amongst those 87%. I love working at the office. I love the feeling of the daily communication, of jiving with the team and figuring out new solutions. But of course, Everybody wants some flexibility. We all want a different way of working. 
But I'll tell you, I just don't think that opinion is shared by everybody. What do some old guard CEOs think about this? Reed Hastings, when asked about remote work, said the following. I was kind of surprised. He's the CEO of Netflix. You would think he cares a lot about this stuff. He said, I don't see any positives. Not being able to get together in person, particularly internationally, is a pure negative. David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs. This is not ideal for us, and it is not a new normal. It is an aberration that we are going to correct as quickly as possible. Big Daddy Benioff at Salesforce. What does he think about remote work? He says, we don't have the same level of performance and productivity that we had in 2020 before the pan pandemic. He says, look at, the, at some of the percentages of employees, especially new folks. They are just not as productive. I don't think they're right. At Filevine, we think the old guard has it wrong. Remote work does not mean turning a blind eye to accountability. We think great leaders meet talent where it's at. Here's what we believe. We have a nuanced view of remote work at Filevine. And frankly, it ought to be nuanced because humans are nuanced, employees are nuanced, partners, customers, the people we deal with every day, they come to us differently and we should meet them differently. What I'm going to present to you is essentially Ryan Anderson's theory of remote work. Take it for what it's worth, but I can tell you as somebody who struggled with this internally at Filevine, I put a lot of thought into it. I think that we should look at remote work on a double axis, a quadrant, essentially. On untrained versus trained, unproven versus proven. And let's walk through sort of why that makes sense to think about those two pairings. I'm going to give you a few examples. Let's take John. John is a new summer associate, fresh out of his first year at law school, maybe his second year at law school. John doesn't know much about really anything. For those of you who've trained up new associates, I can tell you, and I'm sure you already know, they're not worth a damn. And <laughs> And yet John, if he tells you the only way I'm going to come work for you is with a remote position, don't hire him. That's my view. In my opinion, an untrained, unproven candidate really needs the office experience to absorb, to learn, to be facilitated, to understand the culture of the group he's going to work with, to to just see and learn by osmosis. So much of learning in office is turning to a friend in a highly quick, feedback-heavy way and saying, hey, how do you do this thing? Oh, that's right, that's how you do this thing. It's those repetitive micro-muscle movements that can only be learned over time and repetitively. Caleb. Caleb is trained, meaning he's gone through our trainings. We think there's promise with Caleb. He's done all the things we've asked him to do. He's watched the videos, he's taken the tests, you know, it, it appears that he knows what he's doing, but he is not proven. Caleb has not shown that he can actually produce results. In my view, Caleb needs to be in the office at least some of the time. Maybe not always, but at least some of the time. Because again, there are things Caleb will simply not learn unless he gets in a desk and sits next to people who are much better at their job than he is. Let's talk about Mia. Mia may come to us as perhaps an IT director. Uh, 10 years of experience, clearly proven, knows exactly what she's doing. However, she isn't proven at our firm, at our company. How do we, how do we handle somebody like Mia? Again, I would say that's a remote position. That's somebody who should, uh, excuse me, that's a hybrid position. That's somebody who probably needs the benefit of the office, but also needs the benefit of uh, being able to have the kind of flexibility that somebody at her stage in her career with her experience, her knowledge, her reputation deserves. And lastly, let's talk about Sally. Sally's trained and proven. She is a five-year attorney with proven results and gets those results consistently. 
this person should be able to work remote whenever she damn well pleases. We are lucky to have her. So, it's not perfect, but there you have it, Ryan Anderson's view on remote work, which I think is way better than simply saying, everybody back at the office, or you never have to come into the office, or three days a week, which well, I don't even know, like, that's some scientific way of doing things. That doesn't make any sense at all. I think this makes a little bit more sense. Back to the main topic, the state of the world and how it's changing. We believe employees today are more scarce, more expensive, demand more, and require flexibility. And that against a backdrop of an extremely challenging macro environment. Something has to give. In the world of artificial intelligence, there's been one name that's been on everyone's lips lately. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. OpenAI, the San Francisco-based startup that created ChatGPT, opened the tool up for public testing in November 2022. In under a week, the AI model amassed over a million users, according to OpenAI's CEO. By the end of January, ChatGPT was averaging about 13 million visitors per day. Even though generative AI like ChatGPT still has a long way to go, predictions about how the technology will influence our society are already swirling. One prominent discussion centers around generative AI's propensity to replace some human workers. Among the industries that may be most affected by ChatGPT, experts say, are journalism, law, and translation. Programming may also change, with companies already training generative AI models to write basic code. Relatively few of the stories in newspapers or on television news are done as investigative reporting. They're more reporting information, and that's something that generative AI is exceedingly good at. There now are an increasing number of tools for generating briefs, which lawyers write. <laughs> tools like this, Barron says, even have the advantage of customizing briefs for a specific judge by taking all of the data of their past opinions and seeing which briefs succeeded in winning the case. We are living in a new world. A world that is increasingly going to be about how we use AI. But again, I have, I believe, somewhat of a nuanced view around how that will impact us. To understand that nuanced view, let's take a step back through history. In the 1960s, law students learned, learned legal research in law libraries. And, you know, we say the 60s, look, I had to learn law research in a library. I had to learn it by book. They actually required that at BYU Law School at the time. I don't know if they still do. Um, there are many people in this room who learn to do legal research with a book still today. And yet, can you, can you imagine not being able to use uh, cloud-based, computer-based legal research today? That doesn't even make sense. A lawyer would find herself completely obsolete in this market if that was still where they were. In 1974, we see the first personal computer that was developed. Let's talk about that for a minute. We think, oh my gosh, personal computing's been around forever. Of course, everyone uses a personal computer to practice law. Not so fast. There are firms in this room, I'm not going to say the name, but there was a larger firm that I was personally part of the implementation on. So, you know, I'm sorry about that, first of all. But when I went to that firm, and after the implementation was complete, it's a very prestigious firm, I, I was invited into the office of the managing partner. I walked in, the managing partner, I think was mid-70s. Beautiful office, mahogany walls, huge uh, conference room table in the office. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous office. There were legal uh, secretaries milling about. There were books on the table, depositions. There was not a single computer to be found. This lawyer had grown up without using a computer. Again, I would argue, if you were to take that position today, you would find yourself obsolete. In 1977, the launch of the first local area network at Chase Manhattan Bank was established, which of course led to email in 1988. In 2002, Amazon launched AWS, starting what we would consider today to be the cloud era. I would also argue that a lawyer today that refuses to use the cloud is a lawyer that is saying to themselves, I'm okay with being obsolete in the next five to 10 years. And of course, now we have AI. AI will indeed change how we practice law. There is no doubt in my mind. 
but it won't make us obsolete. ChatGPT was, oh, was done by uh, Sam Altman, a big famous guy. He, he, um, he was from Y Combinator before. Uh, but what's important for me to tell all of you is that given this history, AI is not the last thing. It's just the next thing. It's just the next thing you're going to have to learn to use on a day-to-day -day basis in order to practice law in the way that your clients will demand. In fact, almost one in four companies state that they are adopting AI because of the price of labor today. It is simply too much. Our AB marketing team, our marketing team has AB tested tons of taglines on our website. And I'm going to get in some trouble for this, but I'm going to show you what is by far the most popular tagline on filevine.com. Filevine, that one employee that never takes a vacation. We care a lot about productivity, and it's much harder to get. So how does that all impact legal? Well, legal's not going away. There is a lot to do. In fact, the government believes that we will need more lawyers, 80,000 more lawyers, to accomplish today what, what we'll need to accomplish in the next eight years. There's a lot of work coming out of us. Law has gotten, gotten a lot more complex. But what does that mean for our customer? What does that mean for our community? What does that mean for all of us? It means we have a high-stress environment, lots is layered upon us, long hours, short-staffed, and challenging work. So how should Filevine respond? Filevine is incredibly bullish on AI, but not as a standalone product. AI works best when it has a platform it can learn on. The reason ChatGPT3 is so good is because it has a huge model on which to train, a massive data set on which it can train its AI models to produce stunning results. The good news is that a model like that needs to train on a system that tracks workflows, manages documents, stores data, and houses communication. Sounds a little bit like Filevine. And I can tell you, we will build AI into all of this. AI will not replace you, because Filevine will help you adapt. We have teams of developers working on features right now. The Outlaw team is currently working on ML features. The legal futurists are researching and developing the embryonic stages of incredible AI use cases. You should go up and check out their lounge um, later on today. But of course, not all AI, not, not all tech is AI. There's lots of tech that is not AI. And we're going to talk about a lot of them here today. I got to tell you, as I mentioned before, we've got a ton to discuss. Um, we're going to go through a few problems on, that will kind of direct you as to what kind of features you can expect us to roll out. So if I want to expand my practice, but I have challenges with intake today, we've got some updates for that. We've got some very cool features for that. Let's say I think it's too long. I think it's taking too long to get the signatures I need on the documents that have to be get signed. We've got big features rolling out on that. I want to communicate better with a remote workforce. We've got answers for you. Awesome, brand new answers that all of you have been waiting for. I want all of my data in one place. The promise of Filevine has always been that we would take all of your data and put it into one place. And I can tell you, after this conference, you will never see more progress on that than you will today. We have got some awesome stuff to show you on that front. Also, we don't want everybody seeing everything all the time. Obviously, certain people at our law firms should have rights to see certain things, and others rights to see other things. We've got some great permission updates to share with you. And lastly, it takes me too long to find the information and the documents we need. At Filevine, we're going to make that so much faster and so much easier. Folks, we are thrilled to go through this roller coaster ride of an event. We have got an action packed, star studded list of speakers. And beyond that, we are going to be showing you stuff we have been working on for an entire year. This community is at the leading edge of legal tech. We think you are the best of the best. Thank you for coming on this journey with us. Thank you for coming to Salt Lake City. And let's have a great Lex conference, everybody. I can't wait to see you more. Bye, all. Oh.